hello everybody um, and welcome to the Wallace Stevens Society panel, Wallace Stevens and Performance, which we're recording today for the American Literature Association Annual Conference. Uh, we're delighted to be joined by those of you in our Zoom audience and hello and thank you to those of you watching online during the AL conference itself. My name is Hannah Simpson, I'll be the panel chair today. Um, I'll be hosting our three speakers who are Ian Tan, Wan Yu Lin and Kathy Mudgett and they're each presenting on the topic of Wallace Stevens and performance. I have uploaded a copy of the paper abstracts and speaker bios into our chat box here as well, which you should now be able to see if you want a copy. But I'll also introduce each speaker before they begin their 20 minute presentation. And then we'll have a group Q&A session at the end, of all three presentations, we'll hold all questions to the end. So those of you in the Zoom audience, you're welcome to raise your golden Zoom hand during the Q&A session if you want to signal that you'd like to ask a question, which you can find in uh, just beside the, within the reactions button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And then I'll ask you to unmute your microphone, turn on your camera and ask your question. If you'd rather, you can just type your question or your comment into the chat box at any point during the presentations or the Q&A session, and I'll read it aloud at the next opportunity. But other than that, please do keep your microphones muted if you're not speaking. Um, are there any questions or issues before we begin? Is everybody happy? Everyone looks happy. <laughs> and please do be patient with us if there are technical difficulties or delays or background noise in my case in particular, because it's 2021 and we'll all do the best that we can. So our first speaker is Ian Tan, who recently obtained his PhD in English from the University of Warwick. He's interested in modern and contemporary fiction and the relationship between modernist writing, poetics, literary theory and film. His work has been published or is forthcoming in journals including English Literary History, Critique, Studies in Contemporary Fiction, the Journal of Modern Literature, English Studies, Anglia Journal of Philology and Mosaic. He's currently editing an essay collection on Wallace Stevens and literary theory as well. And his presentation today is entitled Ideas of Order in the Theatre, Stevens Drama and Truth Function Performativity. Go ahead, Ian. Thank you very much. Uh, can you see my PowerPoint? Not yet. Not yet. Yes, that looks like it's coming up now. Perfect. My epigraph comes from the contemporary Scottish novelist Don Burnside uh, in the novel Living Nowhere. He begin, he, he writes, what I mean by holy is the sense a theatre goer has of the magic of things in that moment when the lights go up soft and golden of blue, rich, and green with the implication of rain, singling out and illuminating everything they touch, making everything visible for the first time. Just like the Irish modernist writer James Joyce, whose only play Exiles was met with critical incomprehension and public opprobrium when performed, Wallace Stevens' plays rarely solicit analysis and readerly attention in the context of a unified artistic output and approach. Any contemporary reassessment of the dramatic and philosophical qualities of the plays is met with the double difficulty of critical silence and Stevens's own disavowal of them as failed experiments in form, which, open quote, had given him the horrors after a disastrous opening performance of Talos Among the Candles in 1917. Major criticism on Stevens' work, such as offered by Harold Bloom, Helen Vendler and Joseph Riddle, they concentrate entirely on the internal workings of the poetry and how the poems fold themselves into re-elaborations of what Stevens suggests is a theory of poetry as the theory of life. With Riddle going so far as to state that Stevens' plays have added nothing to his reputation. Indeed, Stevens's engagement with poetry as the supreme imaginative act passes through other artistic genres, such as sculpture and painting, as an acting 
analogous transactions between the force of the artistic will and the materiality of objects and the external world, without ever considering theatre as contributing to a philosophical definition of the arts. However, it cannot be denied that Stevens was once excited and energized with the unfolding possibilities of the stage. As Sarah Ford details, Stevens' circle of contacts from the early 1920s immersed, immersed themselves in the theatre and theory and practice of the avant-garde, saw themselves as championing, open quote, heavily symbolic experimentation and strong reaction against realism in American theatres. Now, critics such as Ford, who attempt to reinscribe the centrality of theatricality to Stevens' work, predictably suggest that the poet's open quote, poetic theory is heavily indebted to notions of performance. Close quote. Reading the embodiment of poetic tropes as so much repetitions of speech acts, wherein content becomes imminent to gest gesture and fidelity to the stakes of that performance. Maureen Kravak goes so far as to write that, open quote, thespian metaphors appear throughout Stevens' work, close quote. A critical approach which not only risks collapsing the generic difference between poetry and drama, but also obviates the specific workings of metaphor as it unfolds as reading experience within the space of the poem versus the visuality of the stage. In this paper, I seek a new implication of theatrical experience in Stevenson poetics through the writings of the French thinker Alain Badiou. This perspective remains relevant not only with respect to Badiou's empirical interests in Stevens and the theatre, but also stays close to Badiou's interweaving of poetry, philosophy, and politics. For Badiou, poetry and theatre come together in their manifestations of conditions for the possibilities of thought that Adam great and innovative political practice, one that sets in motion the infinite and incalculable truth effects of an event. Taking my departure from Badiou's writings on the theatre as the site for, open quote, an inauguration of meaning, close quote, I like to demonstrate how the abstractions of Stevenson's theatre delineate a crucial movement between presentability and subtraction. The staging of this dialectic manifests an important link between the generic specificity of the stage and Badiouan in aesthetics. For the event, from Badiou's point of view, is necessarily incomplete and fragile, not only in terms of what it presents as political spectacle, but also in terms of what it subtracts from itself. In other words, performance stages the necessary gap between the perception of situation and the void, the structure's perception as always already being too late for the time of the event. For Badiou, the truth of the event and the event of truth happens in the interstices of performance. The event gathers together a future collective whose ability to respond to the event is pledged, not to the present of its unfolding, but to a open quote, process of fidelity, close quote, which is sustained in the after effects of the event. In this reading, stakes of performance do not simply rest on the self-reflexive meditation of the contingencies of consciousness as theatrical act. Instead, hinge upon a gathering and an unfolding. The philosophical function of Stevenson's theatre in terms of the commentary upon the well-known issues surrounding perception and reality can be, therefore, I argue, funneled through the, the idea of performance as event in the theatre. How theatre becomes important to this debate is the Baduan recognition that the voiding of the event inheres in the true situation it can never become a part of. In other words, perception is necessarily theatrical when it registers a void between the reality it embeds itself in and the reality which becomes in excess to it. Now, by a short reading of Three Travelers Watch the Sunrise and Colors Among the Candles, with respect to the Baduan themes of eventual incompletion and gathering, I seek to fold this philosophical notion of theatricality and committed spectatorship up towards the tropes of the stage in the poems, demonstrating how the performativity of poetic voice and power ironically adumbrates the alternative powerlessness of the event as it comes to pass within and outside of language. Now, if we look at Stevenson's own pronouncement of theater 
uh, we might see a kind of dismal, uh, 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 a disavowal of the possibilities of the stage. Uh, from his letters, uh, these are just four quotes that 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 that, that come together. Uh, 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 not only in the context of contemporary reflections, but also in terms of a kind of retrospective uh, look back at, at a complete over uh, of work that Stevens was was was, was very much concerned with uh, at the, uh, uh, towards the end of his life. The winner of a 1916 contest for a one-act play in the literary magazine Poetry, Stevens's three travelers watch the sunrise oscillates between the gaudiness of stagecraft and the stark paucity of reality which composes the final tableau of the play. This evinces a Baduan play between the multiplicity of the event in situation and the voiding necessarily necessary for the situation to become a site of happening. Stevens's note attention for exotic color transpires not only in the uh, open quote costumes of silk, red, blue and green, Close quote, which the three Chinese travelers adorn as quasi Yatesian performance masks, but also in the non Eurocentric worldview and body in their philosophies, which forms yet another performative multiplicity that saturates, yet fractures the event of the stage. Joan Richardson notes that Stevenson's interest in the East in the context of offering open quote, epistemological and ethical differences to a Western audience, close quote. Uh, yet the conflict that structures the play rests not so much in the interaction between Eastern and Western thought than it is in the clash between the elements of performance and what reality ultimately makes visible as irremediable rupture. Now here the extra didactic situation surrounding the play becomes an important part of the theatre effect. As Brenda Murphy notes, the setting of the play on a hilltop in Eastern Pennsylvania becomes associated for a contemporary audience with the brutal lynching of Zachari Zachariah Walker in 1911. This violence forms an essential part of the play's interest in visuality. This place, as it is in the context of the tragic love story between the girl Anna and the lover who hangs himself during the preceding night. As the audience brings to bear their real world knowledge about Walker's lynching, as it is reflected through the theatrical impact of, open quote, the body of a man hanging to the limb of a tree, close quote. Stevens's play sustains a participatory gathering wherein the multiplicities invoke via the play between political context and aesthetic image. In other words, Stevens arguably traces the outline of the truth event, which takes his departure point from the theater, cutting across issues of class, race, and gender. For Buddy and Stevens, the theater can accomplish a heightening of consciousness which clarifies the state of affairs in the mode of crisis without necessarily providing any easy solutions or sublation of conflict. Stevens thematically pursues his notion of multiplicity through the interplay between the viewpoints of the three Chinese travelers. Now, why did a widely accepted interpretation of the structural significance of the characters in the place provided by Riddle as such? Open quote, the Chinese represent three abstract attitudes one may take is of the otherness. First, Chinese is a devotee of objective, tangible reality, including necessarily its rude violence. The third, Chinese is purely subjective, speaking only as it feels. While the second, Chinese, the theoretician, is a realist between two extremes. Quote. Obviously, the problem with this approach is that it obviates much of the specificity of what these characters say and do. For I argue that Stevens does make an evaluative judgment on whose approach to reality best presents the philosophical trust of the play. Now, critics like Murphy and Ford have identified the third Chinese who best represents Stevens as a poetic poet figure, although the terms of comparison have not been clearly worked out in relation to the play as theatrical experience. So therefore, I want to focus instead on the link between multiplicity and indetermination and the third Chinese vocalizers. As the three characters muse on the effect of a shining light on a porcelain water bottle, the third Chinese foregrounds the fact that, open quote, there are indeterminate moments before the sun rises, before one can tell what this bottle is going to be, close quote. In the context of my argument, this notion of indeterminate indeterminacy announces a superior epistemological, epistemological position from the other two travelers. 
one who is given over entirely to reality as apprehended by an empirical position, and the other who draws his store of wisdom entirely from maxims. In reading the third Chinese as such, I do not merely wish to repeat the cliché that the Stevenson poet figure is the poet of capable imagination who is able to sustain momentarily a momentary accord between imagination and reality. Rather, I argue that it is indeed not all of indeterminacy that poetic consciousness theatricalizes itself. In other words, it is the third Chinese who is best able to confront the negation of the imagination as it is envisaged by the death of Anna's lover, because in contrast to the totalizing tendencies of his other two companions, he intuits the radical voiding within the space of the theater that allows the truth event to, write, to arise. This once again de delineates a crucial gap structuring phenomenological intentionality, which becomes for Stevens productive of truth as revelation. Indeed, the dialectic between multiplicity and indetermination structures the last speech of the play. As the third Chinese jarringly brings together the water bottle with the corp on stage, he muses on the phenomenology of color and coalesces the elements of staging with their thematic resonances. So, 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 so he goes, red is not only the color of blood or indicating the body of a man's eyes or pointedly of a girl's. And as the red of the sun is one thing to me and one thing to another, so it is the green of one tree and the green of another, without which without it would be all black. Sunrise is multiplied like the earth on which it shines by the eyes that open on it, even dead eyes, as red is multiplied by leaves of trees. Now this passage, therefore, method theatrically, posits the definition of the theatre as being both immersive and subtractive. Multiplicity is crucial to its functioning, for it is in the interplay of costumes, props, actions, semi bracken songs and dialogue that the impact of the corpse gains tragic resonance. However, as the play demonstrates, death subtracts from the elements of visuality as much as it belongs with one pitch as the redness of passion and liveliness. Met philosophically onto Badiou, Stevens, Stevens play demonstrates that the truth event must inhere in the multiplicity of presentation without ever being able to be predicted by it. Indeed, indeterminacy allows the audience the imaginative freedom to be suspended within the space of the happening of truth that comes to pass as ontological rupture. Mm. Now, Carlos amongst the candles furthers the aesthetic of three, three travelers by incorporating the void as the organizing principle of the drama. It's minimally staging, anticipating theatrical experiments by Beckett and Harold Pinter. Stevens' play reflects moments of consciousness with which pulsate between imaginary, imaginative insight and despondent diminishment. However, it distinguishes itself from Stevens' earlier play, Three Travelers, in its emphasis on gathering together the audience within the space of absence opened up by the stage. From the beginning of the play, Stevens says Carlos rehearses an important concern of Stevens, that of consciousness being embedded yet distinct from the external world he tries to appropriate through imaginative insight. As he lights the candles in the room with his taper, Carlos remarks how the act of lighting, open quote, fills the darkness with solitude, which becomes my own. In this way, Stevens highlights the way in which the entirety of the drama unfolds within the void and once made present by the light of perception and subtracted from presentation. The gap between the power of the imagination and the otherness of reality thereby takes theatrical shape in the juxtaposition between light and darkness. More than this, Stevens also demonstrates how the seeking after imaginative truth must necessarily manifest as an effect of the not all represented by the void. This insaturation of the void, irreducible to the dialectics of being and non-being, is then what allows the imagination the freedom to think the event from the outside of ontology. Carlos emphasizes, emphasizes this when he says that by standing in the light of the imagination, open quote, I know myself to be incalculable since the causes of what I am are incalculable, close quote. This movement 
movement delineates no less than the birth of an authentic subject who for Badiou inaugurates an unforeseeable sublimination in being through a truth event. For Stevens, the dramatic self is here incarnated by the situational co coordinates of the absolutely unforeseeable event. This scission in being, here dramatically presented by the darkness of stage, allows us to concretize the dynamics of the Stevensian imagination in terms of a force which returns continually to poeticize the vital, arrogant, dominant X in motive or metaphor of reality that refuses to yield itself to language. Carlos's theatrical performance also incarnates a dimension of universality, which for Badiou defines the coming to pass of a truth procedure. As his imaginative vision expands, he starts to think, open quote, of myself in other places in such a light, or of other people in other places in such a light, close quote. This capacity later defines a politics of gathering, wherein subjects who are instantiated by the true procedure of poetic vision are simultaneously, open quote, gathered and affected, close quote, by the happening of theatre. Inasmuch as the audience's vision is conditioned and mediated by the elements of staging, Stevens implies that it is the audience who also participate in this novel unfolding. Theatre and politics pre precipitate as events where universal truths are enacted and debated in situation. For Purdue, this di distinguishes theatre from the cinema, the genre not requiring for Purdue a committed spectatorship. Even as Carlos effects this gathering, not only through the universality of its symbols, but also through a synthesis of stage design, language, music, and choreography, which tightly focuses our attention on how consciousness fluctuates between reality and unreality. Even the imaginative adventure of Carlos is shared by us too. Drama and poetry become integrally universal ways of relating to the world. What Stevens ultimately defines through this formal experimentation is a drama of exposure. For using the theatre to countenance the birth and death of vision, he exposes this vision to its very limits of its possibility. Stevens's poetic imaginations become dramatic to the extent that it brushes up against its own negation. Or as, his, or as he states in the poem, The Plain Sense of Things, the question of imagining, open quote, the absence of the imagination, close quote. For Buddy and Stevens, theatre reveals the paradox of the void in being as being both recalcitrant to and productive of perceptive presence. In sum, the theatrical in Stevens crystallizes a situatedness of visibility, which enacts a dynamic of imaginative possession and worldly retreat. Reading the way in which imaginative perception embeds itself in complex acts of re envisioning in Stevens, evinces a multiplicity which structures dramatic vision while understanding the intransigent resistance of what refuses itself to poetic reshaping is to locate the extrinsic sense of truth that brings Stevens's drama and poetry together as artistic analogs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. Let me just use your pin and we'll get one you up next. That was wonderful. And thank you also to your teeny tiny assistant, who was glorious. Thank you. Um, our next speaker then is Wan Yu, who I'm going to pin to our screens now. Uh, Wan Yu Lin is a PhD candidate in the English Department of National Chengchi University in Taiwan. She obtained her MPhil from York and her MA from Leeds in England. And alongside reading Wallace Stevens and teaching English, she's also been serving as a postgraduate representative of the Modernist Studies in Asia Network since 2018. Her presentation today is the beautifully entitled the Spirit Speeches, a Spectator's Theatre of the Mind in Stephen's Poetry. Go ahead, one you. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, let me try to uh, share my slides. Share. Yeah. Is that okay? And uh, um, thank you, Ian, for your paper. Um, <laughs> mine is going to be a quick one. 
um, it's really my honor to um, come to this conference today to um, share um, what I'm currently working on um, as a part of my PhD dissertation. And uh, I'm going to um, begin by showing this quote from Stevens. So he goes, I think that the artist's function is to make his imagination theirs and that he fulfills himself only as he sees his imagination become the light in the minds of others. His role in short is to help people to live their lives. So this quote will come up again. And uh, this second slide shows my proposition and I'm only going to um, show the first part. Stephen's poetry helps us understand that internal spectatorship in his poetry, um, so the spectatorship in his poetry provides necessary models for us to imitate his way as a trend or to turn away from the wrong path he has illustrated in his poetry. So in the following slides, I'm going to be reading um, several poems, part of his um, poems to um, first um, explain what I mean here by the spectator's um, um, theater of the mind. So the first is from um, uh, Note Source Print Fiction. So this line actually ends this section and right before this line, if you remember it um, clearly, it's actually maybe some kind of nonsense, <laughs> um, something that takes place. And then all of a sudden, in my view, this is actually the point uh, announcing, but at the same time, in, in uh, inviting the audience, the reader of the poetry to also commentate on what we have read. Now from the same poem, Stevens um, claims that we are the mimics. So we um, imitate. So together with the poets, we imitate. We imitate clouds, we imitate darkness, we imitate uh, flowers. And then in the end, we offer together as uh, the spectator of all the images, the so-called sweeping meanings. And then that's completely outside of um, the images, but then inside of the theater of the mind. Then um, also from the same poem, but later on. So perhaps there are moments of awakening. So together we sit and behold the, acad the academy's like structures in a mist. So my point here is not really about uh, what we behold, but we behold together. Then uh, this is the last one from the, this from a note towards the a supreme fiction. Um, if I understand it correctly, then uh, in this theater, the poet has invited or involved a leaner being, and then this leaner being moving in on him. So perhaps we are also a part of the him here. And this linear being um, said things it had laboriously spoken. So this is linking to um, the words, the speeches, the spirit speech, speech the sounds. So I would like to um, go down to this next. Um, well, I'm not going to have time to uh, go through all the slides here from this poem, but uh, um, I, I just would like to um, ask maybe my audience whether um, this is sufficient to um, quote Stephen's own poem as the theory, the theat um, theatric, um, theatrical, not theoretical um, foundation. So to prove um, what I'm trying to propose here. So he already says very clearly back in 1923 that the poem of the mind in the act of finding what will suffice. So this is actually um, the beginning of the poem and it goes on. So ex expressing an emotion as of two people and then the theatrical presence 
the actor is a metaphysician in the dark, twanging an instrument, twanging a wiring string that gives sounds passing through sudden rightnesses, wholly containing the mind. So the, uh, a few key words here, the actor and then the metaphysician, the mind. Then um, containing the mind below which it cannot descend, beyond which it has no will to rise. So, so far, I hope my presentation sounds good to you because I'm actually using mostly Stephen's words. Um, and I hope I was also um, demonstrating. I was one of the people in this poem, the man on the dump, beat and beat um, for that which I believe to be true or um, I believe Stephen's believe to be true. And that's what I want to get near. So maybe a bit of break from um, his poems. The next slide, um, sorry, it's uh, very um, crowded here. Um, I need to thank the Wallace Stevens Society um, for um, publishing uh, various um, articles that are very informative to uh, for my um, learning of Stephen's poetry. So here I have selected um, the never ending meditation from uh, 2008. Um, so the author goes contrary to so reading um, uh, an ordinary um, evening in New Haven, the author goes, contrary to both Vendler's and Bloom's reading of the poem as being concerned with issues of aging and decay. Now, the author actually uh, offers a pragmatic reading of the poem, and that reveals Stephen's attempt to find what will suffice. So that's actually from of modern poetry in the quotidian uh, phenomena. Now, my dialogue with the author is on top of the um, pragmatic reading, um, Stephen offers theatrical presences. And I hope I have uh, um, explained what I mean by this phrase in, uh, um, when I was going through the previous slides. Then uh, from page 100 of the same article, over the course of 31 cantos, um, Stephen succeeds in both keeping his subject unfixed and in acting the pragmatic method of bringing the weight of reality to bear on imaginative figuration and abstract proposition. And on top of that, and I, I think that's a um, very um, um, clear view, but on top of that, I um, hope to argue that um, the poet is flexible, playing both roles of the seeing and the seeing. So um, he's involving us readers of his poetry um, to take part in the spectatorship, but at the same time in the poem that he's creating, he's also seeing all those images and being seen by us. So, um, yeah, so that's, I, I think that's maybe a little more than uh, just keeping his subject unfixed. I think it's perhaps um, fixed and, and, and unfixed. <laughs> um, and then um, the last quotation from this article, uh, the author says that the poem reveals a double awareness that we are grounded in a real and shared external world. And we are also simultaneously constructing our own senses of that world. So it's uh, um, a lot is uh, going on. And uh, here I would like to uh, quote from uh, Bonnie Constello's article uh, that's also in my uh, abstract. So one task of, uh, for the imagination is to make not just the self, but ourselves a vital unit in the mind. And uh, to uh, push that forward, I will add that that is accessible because it takes place in the theater of the mind, of the point. So this task is accessible, is uh, possible for us to um, practice because it takes place in the mind of ourselves and as well as in the theater of the mind of the point. Um, originally, I was going to um, close with um, traces that I have collected from this um, later poem, 
uh, dedicated to um, Santayana. And then I think um, at the moment, I would like to just uh, go into my proposition. Uh, so this is uh, showing you the uh, ending part of my current proposition. So Stephen's poetry helps us understand the internal spectatorship. So we can perhaps more easily pick up some of that measure by loosening up to look into the theatrical presences of his poetry. So as a uh, member of the audience, we attentively take part in the spirit speeches not just as a listener in the snow, but in the spirit alchemy kana, as a spectator in search of, and all these phrases are actually taken from an ordinary evening in New Haven, uh, possible for its possibleness, saying words of the world are the life of the uh, world. So at the moment, I'm suggesting that um, the spirit speech, um, spirit speech uh, involves the words, and these words are um, helping us understand our own life of the world. So life and poetry are um, maybe one. So um, I would like to congratulate Wallace Stevens for being very successful, successfully uh, fulfilling his own role, um, introducing to us um, how he, um, um, he imagines, how he um, sees, how he beholds, um, in an imaginary world or an imagined world. So we imagine together with him, we collectively um, serve the role of uh, the spectators in the theater, inside the theater and um, um, near the stage, um, um, but then also at the same time backing <laughs> um, wherever we are in our um, maybe non-poetic pre um, presence. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for um, listening to a very quick um, presentation from me. I hope it felt quick. Um, again, my uh, thank you, Hannah, for saying good things about the title of my um, current attempt, The Spirit Speeches, A Spectator's Theatre of the Mind in Stephen's Poetry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ranyu. That was wonderful. Let me continue. And we will move on to our third speaker who is let me just get the bios up as well um you think i'd be much slicker at zoom after a year and a half so our third and final speaker is Catherine mudgett from massachusetts maritime academy Catherine holds a jd from the university of connecticut school of law the campus of which is just down the road from wallace stevens hartford home and she has a phd in literature from northeastern university She's currently Professor of Humanities and specialises in the intersection of American law and literature. Her paper today is entitled A Perpetual Falling with a Perpetual Self-Recovery, Walking as Performative in the Art of Wallace Stevens. Go ahead, Catherine. Oh, you're muted, Catherine. I was muted, sorry about that. I just wanted to start by saying that, um, thank you for your paper one, you, because it, it's, a, it's a very good segue into mine when you were talking about how we as spectators are constructing our senses of the world as Wallace Stevens is doing the same in his poetry. Okay, so we have this wonderful picture of Wallace Stevens up here. It's a photograph of him twirling a cane circa 1922, and it captures the poet in mid stride as he moves toward an unknown photographer. Stevens is in a suit and a tie, a grin on his face, a banded hat shading his eyes, and his cane, as is his body, is in motion, its tip pointing almost vertically in line with a tree trunk behind him. It is spring or summer, the tree in leaf and the ornamental plants beside the path in bloom. The sun is bright, casting the shadow of the poet's legs and lower torso across the path as he nears the camera. He is likely in Elizabeth Park, a short distance from his then apartment on Farmington Avenue in Hartford, and where he would walk often during his life in the city. Another picture taken of him by wife Elsie in the same park in the same year shows him in civil, similar dress and surroundings. But here he is moving, captured in the middle of a step, walking under his own power and at his own pace as he was wont to do his whole life, rather than avail himself of the technology of modern life, cars, buses, that would hasten him to his destination. 
The pace of walking is the pace of thought. On his own, on foot, Stevens engaged his mind and body with the outer world in a rhythm he found conducive to poetic composition. Through the ages, humans from the peripatetic philosophers to poets and writers have understood the rhythm of walking as aiding the process of thinking. The act of walking is both observational and improvisational. The walker, stroller, saunterer, all move at a pace allowing participation in the life around them while remaining apart, observant. And each walk has its own choreography. The pedestrian never encountering the same environment twice nor the same exact pattern of steps. The path, sidewalk, or trail itself taken is itself a monument to walking as a form of human engagement with the world. It's in its ephemerality, walking is performative art, evanescent without the technological aid of film. In its universality, it is an art we all perform, an act we all share. Walking is quotidian, walking is democratic. Humans walk, the act signifies our humanity. If we lost the ability to emulate through space, we would be bereft of a significant means for our body to mediate between our consciousness and the world. The physician Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. was inspired to write The Human Wheel, Its Spokes and Fellows in 1863 in response to the battlefield carnage of the Civil War, by the end of which soldiers had ultimately endured an estimated 60,000 amputations of arms, legs, hands, or feet. And just as a side, my great grandfather, uh, Edwin Gallup, lost a leg at Cold Harbor in Virginia. Holmes' concern was with the lower limbs, those appendages that propel humans through the world and that these men would need to replace with artificial limbs to regain their place in a bipedal world. One who has lost a leg is a uniped. He who has lost both legs, a nulliped. That nullity, the loss of self-propulsion, changes, diminishes a person's engagement with the world. Holmes praised the developments in prosthetics that would allow these mutilated men to regain the power to walk, an activity he called a most complex, violent, and perilous operation, which we divest of its extreme danger only by continual practice from infancy. Holmes identified walking along with talking as the two accomplishments common to all humankind. Bipedalism is, in fact, an evolutionary advancement that preceded our development of language. Once humans adopted the bipedal stance, Cerebral development followed, leading to the invention of language. The biologist E.O. Wilson has called our linguistic ability the supreme achievement of human evolution, without which we would have remained animals. Without metaphors, he says, we would still be savages. The physician, biologist, and Nobel Prize winner Gerald M. Edelman has speculated that bipedalism may also have allowed complete freedom of the forelimbs so that gestures assumed increased communicative significance. Holmes' essay describes the complexity of the wonderful art of balanced vertical progression humans practice every day without knowing what a marvelous accomplishment they have mastered. Holmes describes the precarious state of the body in motion in rhythmic terms. In ordinary walking, a man's lower extremity swings essentially by its own weight, requiring little muscular effort to help it. Thus, there is a natural rhythm to a man's walk, depending on the length of his legs, which beat more or less rapidly as they are longer or shorter, like metronomes differently adjusted or the pendulums of different timekeepers. What makes walking precarious and potentially violent is that the body engages in a perpetual falling with a perpetual self-recovery as each leg takes over balancing our vertical axis from the other. As Holmes describes, man is a wheel with two spokes, his legs and two fragments of a tire, his feet. He rolls successively on each of these fragments from the heel to the toe, having only two spokes available for locomotion. Each of these has to be taken up as soon as it, as it has been used and carried forward to be used again in a delicate, perilous, complicated operation. When Holmes penned his essay in 1863, the photographer Edward Mybridge had not yet made his motion studies revealing the uh, mechanisms of human locomotion, but Holmes anticipated that photography would expose aspects of motion invisible to the human eye and promote the development of a functional prosthesis. 
Photography exposed a re reality otherwise invisible to us, changing both our perception of time and our relationship with the world. Trains, telegraphy, photography, all changed our interrelation with the outer world and the perception of time itself. 19th century cultural commentators used the phrase, the annihilation of time and space to describe the effects of these scientific inventions on human industry and their impact on our daily existence. An 1861 Scientific American article, for example, described how inventions such as the steam engine and the electric telegraph had lightened the burden in every department of human labor while leaving the mind lost in amazement at the speed at which mechanical devices had abridged the labors of man. Walter Benjamin addresses this transformation of human perception in his essay, The World of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, in which he argues that the effect of the invention of lithography, followed closely by photography, both making possible the mass reproduction of formerly unique works of art, was to alter our engagement with that sense of reality and sense of reality and to distance us from the aura or uniqueness of observed objects. Benjamin contrasted the painter who maintains his work a natural distance from reality with the cameraman who penetrates deeply into its web. Modern technology has allowed us to perceive the formerly invisible, such as a person's posture during the fractional second of a stride, yet at the same time has distanced us from the natural, which is imbued with authenticity. In the context of art, Benjamin uses the phrase decay of the aura to describe the tendency of contemporary masses to distance themselves from the original, the authentic, by satisfying themselves with mechanically reproduced copies. This acquiescence in even desire to engage with a mere duplicate distances us even further from objects seen by the unarmed eye. For Benjamin, the advent of mechanical reproduction has changed both the mode of human perception and humanity's entire mode of existence. It is this new reality of which Stevens speaks, in which technology removes many of the purported burdens of human life, leaving the masses with the time and leisure for contact with copies of formerly unique objects, at the same time obscuring contact with the authentic, with things as they are. As cultural, Historian Rebecca Solnit writes, in a technological world, the terms of nature are obscured and one not, need not live quite in the present or the local. In her estimation, memory has been augmented and partly replaced by technological advances, rendering human beings no longer contained within nature. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is the disconnection Stevens decries as when he notes in his journal, quote, how utterly we have forsaken the earth in the sense of excluding it from our thoughts. There are but few who consider its physical hugeness, its rough enormity. It is still a disparate monstrosity full of solitudes and barrens and wilds. But man who is an affair of cities has managed to shut out the face of the giant from his window. But the giant is there nevertheless, unquote. Stevens rejects turning away from the giant's face, instead stepping alone on foot into the external world that still dwarfs and terrifies and crushes where Lilliputians fear to tread. We return, or we're still there, to the photograph of Stevens in mid-stride in the sun in the park. Stevens' preferred method of travel was afoot. Throughout his life, he walked every day whenever possible. Over the course of his life, Stevens walked in rural, urban, wild, and landscaped spaces. In his young adulthood, Stevens took long walks, treks almost, through the Hudson River Palisades when he lived in New York City or out to New Jersey and back. <clears throat> he speaks of a good day's jaunt of 17 and a half miles in August 1902, another a week later of 40 miles, and walks of 25, 30, and even 42 miles in the years 1903 to 1909, each recorded in his journal. He would walk sometimes from early in the morning until sunset. Where haven't I walked, he asked in 1907. And in his later years in Hartford, with less time and more obligations, he would walk to and from the two and a half miles from home and to Elizabeth Park, a mile or so away from his home at his leisure. Stephen's weekday walk between home and office at the Hartford Accident and Indemnity Company can be recreated by anyone who follows the 13 granite stones set out between Stephen's home and office 
each with a stanza from 13 ways of looking at a blackbird, following the poet's footsteps from 118 Westerly Terrace down to Terry Road to Asylum Avenue and the neoclassical office building at 16, 690, where Stevens worked as a surety lawyer for nearly four decades. And this is the wonderful map um, of the friends and enemies of Wallace Stevens. Um, I tried to Google this uh, and, and it refused to only give me the one, one um, journey of his. It, it insisted on putting the pale blue one in, but the walk he would make was this uh, darker blue one. Um, here's Westerly Terrace taking a turn down Terry Street uh, and then he would just simply follow Asylum Avenue all the way down to the Hartford, and then he would walk back home. And then here is Elizabeth Park right here. Um, I'll go back to this one. Um, acquaintances and neighbors have described his gait. A fellow student at college long before Stevens' Hartford days found it rolling, vigorous, and striding alongside him both a feat and a privilege. But most often Stevens walked alone. A Hartford neighbor remembered him passing her house on his way to and from work with the very slow stride of his. And the neighbor noticed something more. As he walked, I could almost see him composing in his mind. He had a very interesting walk. It was slow and rather symmetrical. He almost walked in cadences. Stevens also had a habit of walking in the, to the park every Sunday in all kinds of weather, according to his neighbor. Others saw him there of a Sunday, always dressed in a full suit with a shirt and tie and walking by himself in the back of the park. Even when he walked in Elizabeth Park, Stevens maintained the sartorial formality of a businessman and his aloofness from others. This leads us to the nature of the poets of Stevens' act of walking. It is physically precarious as described by Holmes, but also mentally vertiginous, a balancing act of consciousness in its engagement with the world. Stephen says, we live in a world of the imagination in which reality and contact with it are the great blessings. Fellow poet A.R. Ammons has described a poem as resembling a walk, composing verse as, quote, not simply a mental activity, it has a body, rhythm, feeling, sound, and mind, conscious and subconscious. The pace with which the poet walks and thinks his natural breath length, his line, the line he pursues, whether forthright and straight or weaving and meditative, his whole air, whether of aimlessness or purpose, all these things and many more figure into the physiology of the poem he writes, unquote. Wordsworth is perhaps the most well-known example of the pedestrian poet who composed verses while afoot on his rambles through the Lake District or on his grass terrace at Rydalmount. Those who met him on the road might see his lips a-going as he went along, a woman who had been in the service at the Mount remembered that Wordsworth went humming and booing about, often with Sister Dorothy close behind to pick up the bits as he let them fall and take them down and put them together on paper for him. Stevens admitted to a similar compositional method and the centrality of walking to his means of encountering and relating to the world in verse. He denied having a set way of working, but revealed, a great deal of my poetry has been written while I have been walking. An activity Stevens claimed helped him both to concentrate and to get my movements into the movements of the poems. Never without something to write on, envelopes stuffed in his pocket, says one colleague, during these walks, Stephen would pause briefly to jot, jot down notes. His stenographer, he acknowledged, was able to decipher his cryptic jottings and type up drafts on which he continued to work. In Adagia, Stevens claimed, poetry is not the same thing as the imagination taken alone. Nothing is itself taken alone. Things are because of interrelations or interactions. For Stevens, walking engaged mind, body, and world in relation and in flux, in motion. This, this um, relates to Bergson's theories, which Stevens um, uh, appreciated. We live, Stevens asserted, in mental representations of the past as sensory perception never lets us see reality immediately, but always the moment after. This makes reality and the poetry created by engagement with it an unreproducible performance of body consciousness and world. Stevens' poetic artifacts enact the evanescence of na evanescent nature of our engagement with reality, as in the conclusion of Angel Surrounded by Paisons, when the angel of reality asks, and I've highlighted that this part or underlined it. Am I not myself only half of a figure of a sort, a figure half seen 
or seen for a moment, a man of the mind, an apparition appareled in apparels of such lightest look that a turn of my shoulder and quickly, too quickly, I am gone. For Stevens, the provisional nature of reality is manifested in the interactions between the perambulating poet's mind and body and the world without. The verses themselves reflecting the precarious balancing act of the body through space and time and the vertiginous rhythms of language expressed by the poet's mind. In a, of the surface of things, Stephen suggests the necessity of engaging the giant, the natural world beyond human construction and artifice. In my room, the world is beyond my understanding. But when I walk, I see that it consists of three or four hills and a cloud. The poem as artifact is a momentary seizure of that provisional world passing through the consciousness of the poet. Its evanescence is captured in such poems as the, This Solitude of Cataracts, in which Stevens' speaker yearns to grasp reality in a permanent realization but understands his inability to do so in a world in permanent flux as he passes through it, solitary in his walk. In this solitude, he never felt twice the same about the flecked river, which kept flowing and never the same way twice, flowing through many places as if it stood still in one. The speaker says, there was so much that was real that was not real at all. Acknowledging his inability to grasp the immensity filtering through his teeming mind, his failure to memorialize its authenticity. When he says he wanted to walk beside the river under the buttonwoods beneath a moon nailed fast, he understands that his desire to arrest the moment, any moment, cannot be fulfilled. The ceaseless movements of the river, the earth, are reflected in his fertile consciousness, which together with that world ceaselessly creates it. He knows that if his longing for his heart to stop beating and his mind to rest in a permanent realization were met, he would be released from destruction in the sense of gaining freedom from the unstable vertiginous balancing act among poet mind and world. But he knows it is not possible to reach the azure center, center of time. It is the very oscillations of planetary past pass interacting with his mind and body in an unceasing choreography that allow him to glimpse for an instant an apparition of reality. To attempt to arrest an instant of time not as a photograph does, but as reality appears to the human eye without artificial intervention is the poem and the poet's task. Stephen spoke to the evanescence not only of the external world, but of the poetic creations of his engagement with it. Ariel in The Planet on the Table calls his poems, although makings of his self, no less makings of the sun. The poem in the poverty of its words is a poor representative of the world expressing the poet hopes at best some liniment or character of the planet of which it was part, even if only half perceived by the poet walking in it. Ariel muses that it is not important that his poems survive in a world itself lacking permanence. Stevens has written elsewhere, the poem is the cry of its occasion, part of the race itself and not about it. And that's an ordinary evening in New Haven. Its cry is a transitory sound, audible only when another's mind is attuned to it. And this goes back to the spectators that one you was talking about. Um, it is part of the race, the thing itself, and comes both from without and within the listener's own mind. A scrawny cry from outside seemed like a sound in his mind. And that is from not ideas about the thing, but the thing itself. The poet's concern is not with immortality or permanence, but with expressing, however faintly, his encounter with that world with which he is entwined through mind and body. The poet propelling himself through the landscape in an extemporaneous choreography, glimpses a reality ordinarily beyond his understanding as he encounters the incomprehensible flux of the world. The poem's cry like the poet's walk is of an unfinished nature, an outward reflection of the poet's interior seeking. How we are to confront the incomprehensible flux of the world is the poet's unending digressive journey afoot through the world. Stevens asks and answers, how shall we face the edge of time? We walk in the park, and that's from the rock. If we, centuries, years or centuries later, hear the poem's cry, we may still go with Stevens the walker, 
subtly walking there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. Wonderful. Um, and thank you to all three speakers um, listening to your papers. I think we could perhaps have called this the, the, the a Stevenson perception panel, maybe rather than or alongside performance. We could have had a nice alliterative paper there, but um, your papers spoke really interestingly to each other. Um, I'm going to now invite members of the audience to raise their hands or to type questions into the chat box if they if they would like to pose any questions. But of course, um, our panelists are also free to pose questions to each other. Um, so, but just for the sake of not overloading our Zoom speakers, if panelists, could you also raise your hand if you would like to ask questions to each other as well, just so that we. Um, know who's speaking at any one time. Let me just fix my participants so I can see you all. Wonderful. I'm wondering, um, in the, taking advantage of um, chair authority, <laughs> if I might ask the first question to Ian. I'm really intrigued by you know, this moment in Stephen's career where, you know, for a moment he's writing and writing and writing theatre and he's winning prizes and he's writing about it in his letters and he seems so incredibly passionate about this as a, as a, as a form for work, which he then abandons. And I'm wondering, I mean, you spoke really, you know, this idea of, um, you know, the, the play between the power of imagination and the otherness of reality as a, you know, this key thread that runs through Stephen's poetry. Is there something in that idea that, that would allow us to, to understand both this, you know, impulse towards theatre and then disappointment with theatre that we see in Stephen's career? Or, or, or do you think it's something else entirely? Yeah, I mean, if you kind of, you know, look at the kind of, the the, the almost kind of collaborative and kind of improvisational Provisional kind of mode of you know theater, you know, certainly when when, when Carlos among the candlesticks was kind of put together by a kind of external kind of theater company, you know, a disastrous kind of opening night, you know, way way which you know way which I mean the 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 the, the, the actor fluff, fluffed up part of his lines, you know, it was, it was, it was terrible and and you know I, I you know I sort of you know uh, uh, I kind of like kind of the idea that that. It's kind of famously pushed by uh by Frank Latrencia, you know, uh, you know, in this kind of take of Stevens, kind of in, in a sense, in a sense, almost kind of consciously kind of separating, you know, kind of the public persona from the private, you know, he kind of kept his his kind of you know poetic endeavors quite, quite kind of tightly to his chest. So so you know so I, I kind of guess that you know like he 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 was in a sense kind of buoyed by. You know, winning the first prize for you know, be three travelers, you know, be, being published in poetry, you know, and, and so on, and, and, you know, and, and those kind of kind of kind of you know external factors in a sense influenced you know not only you know kind of the production of harmonium, you know, but but also I think kind of much, much of this kind of earlier work, you know, and so on. so I, I guess you know uh, when looking at the kind of you know the the, the, the construction of the stage. You know, and the utterness of reality, which kind of seems to kind of you know fold into the kind of unfolding of, of, of stage, you know, in, in kind of happy ways, you know, and, and not so happy ways. You know, I, I kind of think of the kind of improvisational, you know, mode of the theater, you know, which also you know stems into a kind of participatory ethos, you know, there, you know, uh, and and, you know, and it's kind of interesting for me to kind of look at the spaces of tension within, you know, within the place. You know, in three, tra three, three travelers. You know, you you you've got the you know you've got the 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 the, the allusion to the, the ending of the job. You know, you have got you've got kind of the the romantic idea of, of the, the well formed object. You know, you you've got that. You know, and you you, you juxtapose that to the kind of the, the openness of the theatrical mode, a participatory ethos. The kind of, the, all the things kind of coalescing together, you know, we, we, what, we, what do you kind of call, you know, uh, 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 terms as kind of uh, a kind of aesthetic mode of incompletion, 
you know, so I, I, I kind of think, think that, you know, like in a kind of happy way, you know, the, the, the kind of the flux of the theater, you know, kind of scared him away, you know, uh, 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 of sorts. You know, I mean, he, he wasn't getting the kind of, you know, the, the, the kind of uh, uh, the kind of feedback, you know, that the kind of draw that they drove kind of, you know, most of his early work, you know, and, and you know, which kind of spurred him towards creation, you know, of, 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 of sorts. So, 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 yeah, you know, uh, uh, that's that's kind of you know interesting question, which for me kind of strikes at the heart, you know, of 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 this tension between kind of you know aesthetic completion and and performative incompletion, you know, which which I kind of find kind of you know interesting, you know, look at in a kind of theatrical way, in a theater, theoretical way. Mm. Mm. Yes, because in a sense, I mean. Thinking about those, those those big key ideas that we understand as running through Stevens' ideas of, of, of perception, reality, and imagination, like theatre should be the perfect medium. This this mode that relies on here is the literal con you know concrete fixed thing in front of you, which of course does not operate in quite that stable way. You're always you know you have that multiple gears on it. You have that almost um, metaphorical is a little too strong, but that metaphorical perception of what you're actually watching in front of you. And yet, it 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 feels like it's almost too perfect. It, it, I, I like that idea of you know the flux is too much actually to to permit this. Yeah. Yes, Wan Yu. Yeah. Th um. Thank you. And this is also for Ian. And uh, I uh, um picked up um the um notes from your slides, like interior and exterior. And I was also wondering about whether um like the, the boundaries in general. So what's theatrical, what's, what's outside of it? Mm -hmm. So um, perhaps we can focus on what you have um, talked about as the sustaining momentum by light and darkness. So do you think this is seen in his poetry um, done in, in, internally or maybe like outside of the so-called theatrical um, presence or reality what what what, what? <laughs> i don't know maybe this is uh mm. um i, I mean I, I, kind of, I kind of think of you know when, when you i kind of think that that, that poem are uh, the man on the dump you know uh you know which starts you know in a kind of you know a kind of consciously theatrical mode you know in a sense i mean the, you know shine a light you know on, on these things you know like 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 you know these things kind of come in come into presence you know almost you know i mean and I would kind of appreciate you know, almost a kind of you know a, a, a kind of minimalist packet in you know kind, kind of kind of kind of way kind of way almost you know and 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 in a and I kind of you know look at spaces of tension kind of within the poetry as you as you suggest you know between 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 light and dark you know not only that you know but also you know the 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 figure of, of capable imagination major man you know, in 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 uh in Owl's Clover, Owl's Clover, for, for instance, you know, so 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 these are kind of figures and, and the figures that that populate most so of supreme fiction. You know, uh, I mean, I mean, for instance, you know, I mean, these are kind of figures of of capable imagination. I mean, these 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 are you know these are kind of figures that that you know that 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 in a sense you know fulfill you know kind of you know life sustaining life kind of affirming ways you know kind of of, of looking at you know. Uh, uh, the imaginative vitality and, 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 and so on and, and and also you know kind of in kind of almost kind of dialectical negation of that you know the the like the 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 the, the sphere of reality that you know that that remains you know resistant to to poetization you know that, that, that remains you know resistant to, to 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 representation i mean certainly that you know that the vital dominant arrogant x you know uh we, which which kind of goes back to in his writings about metaphor you know uh motive of metaphor and jagonomagy and so on so 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 you know so so in so in kind of colors among the candlesticks you know it, it's kind of almost it's kind of almost a kind of a symmetry kind of going on you know in the stagecraft you know i mean the solitary actor you know he he i mean he he lights the candles you know one by one in the beginning he kind of you know uses that as a launching pad to kind of you know to, to muse about about imaginative vistas 
you know, kind of, to kind of, you know, suggest a kind of, as, as you talk about Costello's argument about universality, Costello's argument about the we, you know, the, 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 imagine, the imagination of kind of being, you know, in a sense, essentially shared, you know, amongst kind of, you know, people, the, the, the I versus the we. So, so you get that momentum and then, and then uh, uh, in the second half of the play, you get the kind of, you know, the, the opposite dialectical movement, the extinguishing uh, and, and so on. So, 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 it, so, it, so, I mean, I kind of see it as, you know, kind of not only kind of light, light and dark, you know, but, but also kind of things that, that, I mean, that, I mean, I don't sound too Heideggerian here, but things that kind of, you know, move into visibility, kind of move into presence. You know, but but also you know in that same kind of you know degree withdraw and you know and and absent themselves. So so the kind of you know the 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 kind of theatrical mode here you know that at least for me kind of you know uh 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 uh, uh makes visible you know almost kind of certain kind of motifs you know within uh, I mean within you know the poetry you know that that for me kind of go beyond kind of you know Maureen kind of crevex kind of, you know, uh, uh, noted article, you know, which kind of looks at, you know, tropes in the, tropes in the poetry, you know, of, 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 of the act of modern poetry you know, and so on. So I, I kind of, for me, it, it's interesting the way, you know, the way in which kind of, uh, I see the kind of, the, the kind of the movement, the rest, restlessness of the imagination, you know, as uncannily kind of reflected, you know, into the, 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 the drama, you know, at least for me, yeah. And certainly that idea of the, of the restlessness, I think, fits neatly, Catherine, with your idea of, of the vertiginous balancing act, which is, which is which was a lovely phrase. Um, and Catherine, you also have a question in the chat. Uh, David Howlett says, he says, thank you for your presentation. And then says, so the poem you cite, The Solitude of Cataracts, might that be a better poem to memorialize Stephen's walk than 13 ways of looking at blackbirds. Yes. Does that um, make more sense? Yeah, I was thinking about that. I saw that pop up. And um, I'm not sure, I assume that the friends and enemies uh, of Wallace Stevens decided which poem to use. And um, I'm not sure why they chose that one. Of course, I love that poem. Maybe they chose it beca partly because it's one of the most familiar poems to even grade school children. Um, that, that immediately makes you think of Stevens. Um, and also um, perhaps they decided on how many stones they wanted and there are 13, um, <laughs> there are 13 verses here and they chose those instead of the, the solitude of cat cataracts, which has nine. That, that's, I don't mean to be flippant here, um, but I was thinking as soon as I saw that, I said, wouldn't it be wonderful to have this poem, The Solitude of Cataract, somewhere in Elizabeth Park. Let's work on that. Um, and I have, I have done um, the Wall Stevens Walk in, in Hartford. It's, it's wonderful to do. Um, and um, of course, it took me longer than it would take him because I would stop and I was taking pictures of everything. And I said, I'm going to make a calendar of this. It'll be wonderful. Um, and then I don't know where the pictures are. They're somewhere in some device. So, but, but in any case, no, I, I do think that the this, this solitude of cataracts would be, would be a wonderful thing in a, in a, um, in a um, landscaped or a wild setting. I think it would be just, just beautiful in there in Elizabeth Park. Yeah, because I was, I was thinking, I mean, partly just sort of pushed by our you know, lens of, of, of Stevens and, and the performance, if there's that feel almost more literal way then of, of thinking about that those that this the sorry of uh, thinking about the, the the poetry stones in a way that sort of bends your paper back in on itself in a in a, in a slightly upsetting way but 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 this idea of okay if we're thinking about the, the different engagement with reality or the changed mode of engagement with reality there's a wonderful way in which that very very literally as an almost sort of little mode of performance in itself performs exactly that process but I feel like you'd, you'd need a, a sort of hideous physics diagram to show <laughs> why it's all leaping in on itself at that point. Yeah, yeah. Um, when I was working on the paper I read quite a bit of Bergson and his ideas about time and consciousness and I've been studying um, Stevens since I was in college. I had a wonderful um, professor Dr. Estrin 
who hopefully she'll see this someday, um, who taught me and, and you know, the, the emperor of ice cream and 13 ways of looking at a blackbird and, and um, all those other, the most famous poems. And so I've been looking at him for maybe 45 years at this point. And when I started reading Bergson and his interpretations, I, I understood Stephen's poem so much more. I mean, I, I certainly thought I understood, I find him the most difficult poet that I've ever worked with. Um, but when I started reading Bergson, I said, oh, now I, I'm getting all of this. And then I have to say for anyone who hasn't read it, um, Rebecca Solnit's book on walking was fantastic. Um, talking about this whole, the impression that late 19th century people, early 20th century people had with the, the engagement with technology and how it changed the way people perceived the world. It really helped me with his, his poetry as well. Yeah, Catherine, uh, you know, I thought it was kind of, you know, quite interesting, you know, the, the way you kind of position kind of walkers, you know, walkers and, you know, uh, you know, what, you know, in a sense, you know, how, uh, uh, what, what does kind of walking kind of stimulate, you know, uh, I mean, uh, in a sense, and what, what does walking kind of allow, you know, the kind of, to, to manifest itself, you know, in terms of regularity and, and you know, and, and uh, uh, this orientation. I mean, you've, you've got on one hand, you know, as you listen to, to you, know, you speak, you know, uh, on the one hand, you've got, you know, kind of uh, that kind of famous walker, Immanuel Kant, I mean, don't, don't you? Right, you've yeah. Got, you've, got, you've got that kind of, that kind of, you know, clock-like precision, you know, in, in, in this kind of walking, you know, around, you know, Conisberg, you know, and I mean, the kind of cliche that you, you, could, you could tell, you kind of, you could kind of tell time, you know, by, you know, you know by, by Kant's walking. And I mean, on the other hand, you've got, of course, you know, kind of, you know, the, the you know, the, the flaneur, you know, I mean, right. Benjamin's kind of, uh, Benjamin uh, was kind of, you know, uh, take on the flaneur, you know, uh, that, you know, the kind of, that the act of walking as a, as a, you know, as a kind of inability to synthesize or inability to encapsulate kind of the fragmentation of, you know, modern life, which kind of feeds into, in the kind of a whole aesthetic of modernism, you know, that, that in a sense, Wallace Steven, I mean, Stevens is kind of, you know, very kind of distant from, you know, I mean, uh, very distant from, you know, the kind of the, the main kind of modes of, you know, in a sense, Anglo-American kind of modernism, you know, kind of look the, the look of the city, you know, uh, and the inability to synthesize it. So, so, so in a sense, so, I mean, those are the thoughts, you know, that you know came to mind, you know, uh, that you know that, that in a sense, kind of, you know, what this kind of you know walking and being in touch, you know, in a kind of phenomenal, phenomenological way, kind of you know, uh, I mean, inspire or or kind of you know or kind of allow to happen, you know in the poetry yeah so i mean i mean i mean I, I think stevens is you know particular and also peculiar kind of in his kind of relationship you know not only to you know kind of more than it's walking you know but but but, but also in, you know, in a sense kind of you know his sense of uh, i mean his sense of you know regularity you know his sense of you know openness his sense of you know degrees of precision you know and so on yeah do we have any other questions from the audience or from the panelists, of course? In that case, I think it just remains to thank all our panelists. Obviously, usually we give you a round of applause, but you can imagine your round of applause for now. Um, and thank you very much, everybody, um, for attending. Um, you've got lots of thanks coming up in the chat as well. <laughs> Again, no audible applause, but lots of readable applause. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Um, and I hope that we see you at another Wallace Stevens Society event, whether online or who knows, maybe in person at some point. Um, but in the meantime, thank you and do enjoy the rest of your summer. Goodbye. Thank you.